Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hey there, wildlings. Often, when people recall frightening or traumatic events, they come to a point, at least in the retelling, when it occurs to them to ask, why me? This can lead to healthy or unhealthy introspection regarding what one might have done to alleviate or provoke whatever it is that happened. But sometimes, the reasons that things happen to particular people really do come down to wrong time, wrong place. Maybe keep such introspective inklings in mind while taking in tonight's tidbit of terror, Butcher Face, Part 7, by Dash 32. Sorry about the wait. This'll catch you up on what's been going on so far since the last time. I'm really just writing this because I'm waiting for what's coming tonight. After the realization that Butcher Faces Media is actually a type of advertising, I did a little investigation on the topic. I took a class at the uh, local college and even though I am by no means an expert on the topic, I now know how effective it can be. That may be the reason why I could ultimately fight it. Understanding how it works may have given me an advantage in fighting the obsession. You see, advertising draws heavily on psychology, anthropology, neurology, and behavioral studies, imbuing mundane products or causes with symbolic qualities that instill often false visions of individualism in the viewer. One certain type of advertising that seems to fit Butcher Faces media is called shock advertising. This is generally regarded as one that deliberately, rather than inadvertently, startles and offends its audience by violating norms for social values and personal ideals. It particularly uses graphic images to highlight certain causes. Some studies have shown that consumers of this are more likely to remember shocking advertising content over regular advertising. Essentially, it points out how certain kinds of advertising affect you every day, and you may not even realize it. A few days after Chris and I reconciled, I got a call from Dr. Fidham. He wanted to have another session even though we just had one a week before. So I was in his office the next day. He started off by asking if I'd gotten any more butcher face media. I lied and said no. He also asked if I was keeping what I had in a safe place, to which I told him I was keeping in a drawer in my desk in my room. Then he wanted to talk about my developing obsession and I cut him off. I told him that I'd been doing pretty well and I'd made big strides in fighting it. I told him about being kidnapped and about waking up in Butcher Face's barn. He asked if I had called the police about it, and I told him that they wouldn't have been any use. We had looked for their help in the past, and nothing really came of it. I also didn't want to get pulled into a potential investigation if they'd had one actually begun. It wouldn't be good for my life or for my psyche. He said that he understood, but he added that I shouldn't take these attacks lightly. Then he got up and walked to his desk and pulled out the butcher face mask that he had created for our previous session. He just held it in his hand and stared at it for a moment. Then he held it up and asked why butcher face would wear a mask other than to hide his identity. I said I had no idea. He explained that in medieval Europe, masks were used in plays to portray allegorical creatures often gods and monsters. They also were often used in many rituals from around the world for multiple reasons, including for protection from gods and other evil spirits. Variations of these actions were still carried out today, like at Halloween and in Carnival. He then said that Adam and Eve's use of the fig leaves to cover their nakedness after eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil was an attempt to fool themselves and to fool God. 
He finished up by saying, Faces are essential to expressing emotion. They're also the epitome of individuality. Knowing this, you can say that Butcherface and his followers were wearing masks, essentially removing both their perceived emotions and their individuality, and in essence, becoming massless, undefined juggernauts against what they perceived as the metaphorical masks that we all wear. He said that he would have actually found the idea encouraging if they hadn't gone about it the wrong way. Then he stared at it again for a moment and walked across the room and put his mask in the cabinet, which he locked. Then he said that that's all he had to say and looked forward to our next meeting. That weekend, I visited my family. They knew that I was seeing a psychiatrist, and they'd been walking on eggshells from the beginning as if some random action of theirs would set me off and I'd go on a murderous rampage. It also seemed they felt like it was their job to pull me back from my problems. Now, on this particular night, we had dinner, and then they sat us all down to look through old photo albums. They contained all the familiar pictures that I'd seen before, trips to Disney World, Christmas parties, Halloween costumes, family functions, birthday parties. One of them instantly stuck out to me, though. I was a small child in it, maybe four or five years old. This would probably make the time frame around 1990 or 91. I was running around in what looked like a backyard. Chris was in the picture, too. We were playing with other children around the same age. Some adults were in the picture as well, just talking to each other. What caught my eye was that in the background stood a tall, broad-shouldered clown. He was in profile, and his face was heavily painted and emotionless. He wore baggy yellow, white, and red clothes, and a ratty old bowler hat with a large green feather sticking out of it. What made him stick out to me, though, was that he had both of his hands up, and his left hand was missing two fingers. I instantly sat forward and asked them where the picture had been taken. My mother slipped the picture out of the plastic sleeve and read some writing on the back, saying it was a birthday party for a classmate called Jeremy. My father spoke up and said he remembered that party, and he also remembered that Jeremy was a very sick child with developmental issues, and that he was most likely dead by now. I asked them if they remembered the name of the clown, and they both shook their heads, saying no. Disappointed, I later left my parents' house, taking the picture with me. Getting home, I found Chris in the living room watching TV. I pulled the picture out of my pocket and showed it to him. He said, so what, at first. Then I pointed out the clown to him. He had the same exact reaction that I had, grabbing the picture out of my hand and sitting forward on the couch, eyes wide. After seeing butcher face media so many times, we were sure that the clown was the same man. He was missing two fingers, he had the same skin tone, he even had the same body build that we'd seen in all of the videos. I asked him if he remembered Jeremy because I didn't at all. He said that he did vaguely. He was apparently hospitalized constantly and was eventually removed from school entirely. I said that we should look into it, but Chris cut me off saying that I was in danger of getting obsessed again. I promised him that I wasn't. I just wanted to see where this could take us, but he said no and walked out of the room, slamming the door. I went to bed that night with a lot on my mind, but ultimately I did fall asleep. My sleeping schedule had gotten better around this point. Then later, I was woken up by a slight bang and dragging sound. I couldn't tell what it was, but it was in my room. I stayed in bed but continued to look around for the cause of the sounds. I was able to determine that it was coming from the left side of my bed near the bottom next to my desk. There was some light coming into my room through the open door to the right of my bed. Very little of it, though. Then I uh, realized the problem with that. I always closed my bedroom door when I went to bed. The dragging continued from the bottom left of my bed and made its way closer. Quickly, I leaned in its direction, and the dragging stopped dead. I slowly looked over the edge of the bed, but because the 
bed itself was blocking the light coming in the door, I couldn't see the floor in the darkness, though I had the overwhelming feeling that something was looking at me. I slowly rolled in the opposite direction, acting like I was still asleep and waited. I had my back to the, where the sounds were coming from, and I had the overwhelming feeling of eyes burning into the back of my neck. A cold silence filled the room for a good ten minutes. I started to wonder if I was imagining things when all of a sudden I began to hear the thump drag again. It made its way toward me, toward the foot of my bed, and then I felt a tug on my blanket. Whatever it was had accidentally stepped on the corner of the blanket hanging off the edge of the bed. I knew my mind wasn't playing tricks on me. The dragon continued to go around the bed, and now I... The dragon continued around the end of the bed, and it was now crawling past it toward the door, but it stopped again. Whatever it was must have been in the light from the door by now, but my bed blocked the view from that angle. Then I remembered the mirror that sits against the far wall near my dresser. Without making the effort not to move my body, I instead rolled my eyes toward the mirror. The room was very dark, and I didn't see anything. Then I just glanced down, and what I saw caused me to jump out of bed with a yell. Near the darkness of the floor, barely lit by the open door, was somebody lying there wearing a burlap mask, looking back at me. I jumped up and yelled, causing the masked person to do the same and run out the door. I grabbed the katana that I had sitting between the bed and the nightstand just in case of this situation and gave chase. I ran out of the room and down the hallway, throwing the sheaf off the blade as I went. Getting to the living room, he made his way to the already open window near the computer desk. He threw one leg out the window and began to pull the other over the window sill with both hands bracing against the wall. This gave me time to catch up to him. I made a wild stab at him just as his other leg slid off the sill, catching his shirt sleeve near the elbow, pinning him to the wall. With him trapped, I started throwing punches at his face, but he was moving too much and I mostly hit him around his neck and upper chest. He continued pulling at his sleeve while I continued punching. His sleeve finally tore free and he fell outside to the ground, got up, and ran away. Chris had burst out of his room just as Butcherface had fallen out the window and ran up to me just in time to see him disappear into the woods. Then I told him, this is why I wanted to look into the clown and Jeremy's party. Butcherface wasn't going to leave us alone. I wanted to know why. Then he agreed to help me look for Jeremy. Finding Jeremy was actually pretty easy. It was a simple internet search. We didn't actually find much on the boy himself. Uh, it seemed that my father was right. Jeremy must have died at some point in the past. We just basically found an address, and that's about it. A few days later, after Chris had come home from work, we made our way out to the address we found, which turned out to actually be a simple 15-minute drive from my parents' house. Chris's girlfriend didn't want to go. Upon arriving at the location, we weren't sure if anybody was actually still living there. The house was falling apart. One of the windows was smashed with a sheet of plastic covering it, paint was peeling, and the entire house was slightly leaning to the left. The backyard looked similar to the picture, though overgrown. We walked to the door and knocked, not expecting to get any answer. We were surprised to hear movement inside, and walking to the door we heard a woman's voice saying, One minute! Then the door was opened, and we were greeted by a short woman of around fifty with thinning hair. Then she froze, squinted her eyes as if she was trying to remember something. Her eyes then went wide and a big smile formed on her face, and she said, Dash? Chris? Oh my god, I haven't seen you in ages. Come on in, I was about to feed Jeremy. We were surprised that Jeremy was still alive and she explained that he had had some close calls, but yes, he was still alive, though his health was never actually improved and she had had to take care of him all that time. Chris then said, 
Wait, you haven't seen us in about 20 years. How did you remember us? She tapped her head and said, I have a good memory, with a smile. Then she brought us into the dimly lit living room where Jeremy was watching television. I wasn't surprised that Jeremy had had more than one close call with death. He looked dead already. He was sitting in a reclining chair in his underwear. The best way that I can describe him is to say he resembled a skeleton with skin stretched over it. He was at least two feet shorter than Chris or I, even though he was the same age as us. His head was large and misshapen with very thin hair reclining back against the back of the chair, and his limbs were twig-like and malformed. He didn't have the strength to get out of the chair even if he wanted to, and his breath was very labored. She introduced us to him, saying, Guess who's here, Jeremy? Your two little friends from school. He scanned the room with his eyes, but he didn't seem to even notice us. She ushered us into the room, sat us down on the couch next to Jeremy's chair, and went to get his dinner. We awkwardly said hi to him and sat down. We sat in silence, Jeremy humming a tune that seemed only to make sense to him until his mother came back with a bowl of what appeared to be oatmeal. She began spooning the oatmeal into his mouth, and we finally brought up why we had come. We asked if she remembered his fourth or fifth birthday that had his entire class invited to it. She said yes, and added that it was the best birthday party that Jeremy had ever had. I then pulled the picture out of my pocket and asked if she remembered the clown, if she could remember his name. She said, oh yes, he called himself Felix the Clown. He was a very nice man. Oh, did you get one of his presents, too? We asked what that meant, and she answered, About eight years ago, those were very dark times for us. I was feeding Jeremy, and there was a knock at the door. When I answered it, there was no one there, but a package was sitting on the porch, wrapped in brown paper. I brought it inside and ripped the paper off, and it was a beautiful box. That was a good enough gift in itself, but what was inside was even better. She looked at her son and said, Right, Jeremy? He gave a weak nod. She then added, Well, tell your friends what he gave us. He lulled his head in our direction, and it seemed that he noticed us for the first time because he got a look of shock on his face, and with strength we didn't even think he had, he started to push himself away from us as though he thought we were going to attack him. He started screaming, What did you do to him? You said something to him! We both started stammering that we hadn't said anything. She was looking right at us. We didn't even open our mouths when he looked at us. She continued yelling, What did you say to him? What did you say to him? And she pulled him closer to herself. We said we'd go, but just as we were about to leave, in one quick moment, Jeremy pulled himself out of his mother's arms and dived at us. I instinctively stepped out of the way, but Chris wasn't so lucky. He was tackled to the floor and Jeremy started pounding him in the face with his fists. Chris struggled to grab his arms to stop him, but Jeremy kept getting his hands free and continued hitting him. I glanced at his mother to see if she was getting up to help, but she was actually yelling, Get him, Jeremy! Get him! I grabbed him around the chest and heaved him off of Chris, then put him on the couch. Chris jumped up and we ran out the door. Getting to the car, Chris said, Well, that was a bad idea. And I said, Yeah, we shouldn't have done that. And then we sped out of there. While we were on the road, we got a call from Chris's brother, Evan, who said that he was on his way to our house and had something that he wanted to show us. When we got home, we found Chris's girlfriend in the driveway. As we got out of the car, she told us that there'd been a fire in our house, but she put it out. She brought us inside and we found, dive into the hive in five, singed into the carpet in cursive with a bottle of lighter fluid in the hallway as if it had been thrown there. It must have been lit shortly before she found it, because the fire hadn't seemed to have spread very far, and the words were still legible. After opening some windows to let the lingering smoke out, 
Chris's girlfriend, and since you guys have been asking, let's call her Regina, explained that she was here because she had gotten a strange message while driving. Her phone had rung, and when she had answered, a mechanical, computerized voice said, The camera looks into your soul. And then the caller hung up. Just as we were about to analyze this message, the door opened and Evan walked in. After asking what had happened to the floor, he went into how he had also gotten a message from Butcherface. While in the process of moving out of his parents' house, he was loading boxes into his car. He'd found that one of them, uh, full of books, had been pulled out of the car, ripped open, and the books had been ripped to pieces, the torn pages blowing in the wind. Now stuck to the side of his car with chewed gum was one of the torn pages with a book holds a house of gold written on it with what looked like lipstick, which made us assume that this was actually a message from False Face. When he was done telling the story, I made a joke that Butcherface had finally begun multitasking with the message on our floor, Regina's call, and now Evan's note as well. He asked what was in the call, and we explained. We all started debating what the message meant when I, thinking of Evan's note, all of a sudden remembered the book that I'd found in the cave under Butcherface's barn. This led to me having to backtrack and tell Evan about the messages that I'd been receiving. He asked if he could see them, and I went to retrieve them from the desk in my room. But when I slid the drawer open, all of them were gone. I then remembered the night that I'd found Butcherface crawling on my bedroom floor and realized that's why he was there that night, to steal back his media. A good thing I remembered them. I recounted them to Evan in order of how I'd received them. Ten is time to tell a tale. The line was crossed at nine. Count to eight at the last gate. Seven gateways have already been opened and not to heaven. The six will fix and dive into the hive in five. This was actually the first time that I realized these messages were a countdown. In my defense, I'd been getting them over a number of weeks and I hadn't even thought about their significance, but a book holds a house of gold. Could be talking about that book that I'd found in the cave. It could possibly mean that reading that book might mean good fortune. Evan agreed that this was a good possibility and then asked what the camera looks into your soul could mean. I brought up Regina's camera that I had used to light my way out of the cave and the fact that she had found pictures on it but refused to tell me what she found in them. Chris turned to Regina and asked her what was in that series of pictures. Just like when I asked, she refused to answer, adding that it wouldn't help anyone present even if she told us. Evan jumped in and told her to stop being a hypocrite and to tell us. She asked him what was in the box that I'd placed under the coffee table that he looked into, and he refused to tell us as well. Then she said that he was the one who was the hypocrite. Chris and I stepped in and told him to calm down. Evan then appeared to jump in place out of excitement, saying, Oh, 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 um, camera can also mean vault in Latin, so the camera looks into your soul can actually mean the vault looks into your soul. And those messages he sent to you, meaning me, mentioned a line, a gate, gateways, and a hive. Those are all locations that can be very specific. They couldn't all be in the same place. Now we have these other messages mentioning a vault and a book, and you found a book in the basement of Butcherface's barn. A vault can be underground, and Butcherface mentions pits in the videos we originally found. The vault could be just another term for these pits. Could the pits be the tunnels underneath the barn? Well, it sounded interesting, but that would mean that the pits would have to be a physical place, and Butcherface's references always seem to be metaphorical. When I brought this up, Evan said that the only way to find out was to go there and look for ourselves. I told him I would not be going back to that barn. Besides, in the tapes, he described them as the pits of pain and torture. 
Chris agreed with me, and we said we wouldn't be going back to the house of Butcherface. The next week was Christmas. Now, my family has a large Christmas party every year at my aunt's house. This was also the first time that most of my extended family got to meet Emma. We usually have a big dinner, then we open presents. It's not too strict, and anybody can get a present for whoever they want, so... Somebody can get a mountain of presents while others can get two gift cards and that's it. Basically, everyone gets a gift for anyone that they think of. So if something's going on with you that everybody in the family is interested in, you'll most likely get more presents. That's probably one of the only good things about this whole butcher face problem. Everyone wanted to know what was happening with me. I was buried in Christmas presents. One of the presents stuck out though. The writing paper was a reddish brown color and crudely wrapped. The tag said that it was from Santa Claus, C-L-A-W-S. I ripped it open and found out that it was a special edition of King Kong, one of my favorite movies. That was a relief. But when I watched it a couple of days later, the disc wouldn't play. I removed it from the player and found that it was deeply scratched. And I noticed that the scratches were words, of course. Looking closer, I noticed that they said, The key will open the door before the tour. About a week and a half later, I had my next session with Dr. Fidham. On my way there, I called Emma to see if we could do something afterwards. She told me she was in the city visiting Jesse. Before I could say anything, she said, Oh, gotta go, and hung up. Upon arriving, he asked if I'd gotten any new media from Butcherface. I lied again, said no. Uh, we continued our conversation from our previous session. He walked over to that cabinet I saw him place the Butcherface mask in during the previous session, unlocked it, and pulled the mask out. He then went into how he thought the Butcherface media most likely worked. The thing was... He wasn't telling me like a doctor to a patient. It was more like he just wanted to talk about it with someone. He talked about how Butcherface and his disciples have the characteristics of a cult, brought up crimes conducted by some other cults, including the mass suicides committed by members of the People's Temple in Jonestown, Guyana, and the Manson family murders. He went on to say, the idea of banding together into tight groups and wearing masks often removes one's individuality, which is interesting in itself, and wondered why anyone would want to join such a group. Then his secretary walked into the room and whispered something into his ear. He then put the mask back in the cabinet and excused himself, saying that he would be back in a moment. I watched him go, and as I was turning back to my sitting position, I noticed that the cabinet was unlocked, and the door was hanging slightly open. I walked over and opened it up to find his butcher face mask hanging on a hook, surrounded by an assortment of other masks, a pair of spike-covered gloves, and a shelf full of demonic carvings next to a stack of VHSs, cassette tapes, and CDs. A number of crudely made knives were also hanging in there. Then I happened to glance down to the right corner and sitting in a Ziploc bag, were the messages from Butcherface that had been stolen from my desk by somebody in a burlap mask, including the envelope with the line was crossed at nine written on it, and the folded piece of paper with the seven gateways have already been opened and not to heaven. Then the door opened and Fidham stepped in holding a manila envelope. The second he saw me standing next to the open cabinet, his mouth dropped open, and he took a step back as if he wanted to run. I picked up the bag and said, This was stolen out of my desk by somebody wearing a mask like this. Then I pulled the mask off the hook and threw it at him. He let it hit him and fall to the floor without even attempting to catch it. He took a deep breath and told me how I actually wasn't the only patient of his who had come to him trying to fight Butcherface's draw. Most of them didn't succeed. When he'd ask them for any of the media, most of them would just refuse to let it go. He wanted to see it for himself, and he could only think of one way to get it. 
Most of the patients were too afraid to fight Butcherface if he'd break into their homes. I walked up to him and I pulled his collar down, revealing bruises on his neck and chest in the same places that I'd punched the person who stole the media from my desk. He tried to better explain himself, but I cut him off and told him that I was done with our sessions and I wasn't going to be taking his Zoloft anymore, if it really was Zoloft. He nervously said, I understand all that, but somebody slid this under the door to the waiting room. It's for you. And he held up the manila envelope. I grabbed it out of his hand and turned it around. Written in big letters on that side was my name in what I can only describe as a font created by Tim Burton. I tipped the envelope upside down and let its contents fall out, which were a lone page from a calendar from the month of January. A series of red lines radiated out from the box for the 17th and pointed to big red writing that arched around the page, saying, You will be free with the three when you use the key. A few days later, I got a call from Chris's brother, Evan, who asked if I wanted to hang out. When I arrived, he was waiting for me at the front door. He welcomed me into the house and asked how I was doing. I told him about what happened with Dr. Fidham, and he just nodded along and then changed the subject to the fact that he was wondering why Butcher Face was focusing his efforts on me. I said I didn't want to talk about it and that I was giving up anything Butcher Face related after the offense with the doctor. Chris was right when he said that I should have left it alone a long time ago. At one point he got a text and I noticed that when he looked at the message he got a strange look on his face. He then put the phone on the table, face down. He continued talking and I cut him off, saying that I'd been busy that day and I was really thirsty. He froze for a second, looking like he was holding in anger, like how dare I cut him off when he was talking. But he then smiled and said, All right, I'll get you something. He got up and made his way to the kitchen. The second that he was out of view, I picked up his phone and looked at the message that he'd just received. It said, Magnus Frater Spectate, from someone named Felix. I heard him finish pouring the drink and open the fridge, so he was putting the drink back in the fridge and then he'd come back. Now my Latin was a little rusty, so I quickly texted the message to my phone so I could translate it later. I put his phone back where he had had it just as he walked around the corner and gave me the glass. When he sat back down, I tried to change the subject to when he was moving out. He quickly got bored with that convo and said that he had something to do and that he had to leave. I went home and translated Evan's text. Now I knew that I said that I would stay away from Butcherface's messages. But this text could have meant danger to all of us. After a quick trip to the internet, I translated the message to be Big Brother is watching you. Now, even though Big Brother has obvious connotations to uh, the government and authoritarianism, my first thought was about Chris, Evan's big brother. Even though he was still working at this time, I decided to text him and ask him about it. This is the series of texts between the two of us. Hey, I just saw your brother today and he was acting weird. Do you know anything about that? Clear conscience never fears midnight knocking. What? He got a text from someone mentioning Big Brother. Are you keeping tabs on it? You do not exist. Evan could get hurt, man kill one to warn a hundred. I stopped texting at this point, but he kept sending messages like Butcher the donkey after it finished its job on the mill. Only when all contribute their firewood can they build up a strong fire. And Spectio Signum. At this point, I was sick of the texts and sent Leave Me Alone. And he answered back, You two will know what to do. And at this point, I just texted fuck off, and the strange texts stopped. 
about 20 minutes later, I got another message from Chris's phone saying, Dude, what the fuck? I lost my phone this morning, and I just now found it on my desk. Why are you telling me to fuck off? This message was sent at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. To keep the rest of the story short, it turns out that he had lost his phone shortly after arriving at work that morning. He searched for it for a good while and eventually gave up, went on with his day. After being busy for most of that day, he arrived back in his office to find his phone sitting right in the middle of his desk. The only message on it was my fuck off comment and the rest of the conversation seems to have been deleted. After clearing all that up, I asked him if he'd been watching his brother. He said that he had since I told him about the last time that I'd seen his brother. I told him about the text that his brother had received and warned him to watch his back. Everything stayed quiet for about a week, uh, this being until last Friday. I'd finally talked Emma into coming over to my house after not being there since the whole butcher face experience. When I got a call from Chris, who was visiting his family that night with Regina, it turned out that his brother had gone missing. I couldn't help feeling that, man, we can never get a break, but we drove over to his family's house to see what was going on. Evan was still in the process of moving. His room was empty, and his parents believed that he'd been staying at his new apartment over the past few days, but they had attempted to call him, and he never answered. His father drove to the apartment earlier that day when he was supposed to be home from work to see if he was all right. He found the door locked and the mail piling up in his mailbox. Now, his parents had a copy of the key for the apartment, and they were contemplating whether they should just go in and investigate. We decided that that was a good idea, and we all piled into our cars and made our way over there. When we got to the apartment, it was dark and the window shades were drawn. Chris's father walked up to the porch steps and unlocked the door. He pushed the door open a little and reached in to flick the lights on, but the power appeared to be out. I grabbed my flashlight out of my glove box and we all walked inside. We found the place empty. It turned out that the power was actually on, but there were no working lights because none of the light fixtures contained any bulbs. He had some furniture, like a kitchen set, couch, bed, but they were all absent. The floor was also strewn with empty or half-empty boxes. A pile of clothes were pushed into a corner in the living room. In the kitchen, the fridge door hung open and a number of pairs of shoes seemed to have just been thrown on in. Then a loud ring caused all of us to jump and some to scream. It turned out to be my cell phone. I pulled it out of my pocket and saw that the call was from Evan. I put it on speakerphone and answered. He didn't even give me time to say anything, just immediately said, How do you like my place? We asked how he knew we were at his apartment, and he said, Look up. I shined my light close to the ceiling and found a webcam crudely screwed into the wall, pointing at us. Chris asked him where he was. He said that he was traveling and that he was safe. I asked why he was doing all this and how he'd gotten obsessed. He said that he had seen less butcher face media than either Chris or myself. He said, remember that tape we found covered in wax in the attic? Well, dad burned all of butcher face's media, but he didn't burn all of it. See, the wax covered tape was never in the pile of media that we stored in the garage. I took it out of there months before to see if I could clean the wax off it, and I did. I thought you guys might want to see what was on there. It took a long time, and the footage isn't perfect, but I did get all the wax off, and that was good enough for me. You want to know what was on it? We all yelled no into the phone, but he hadn't even stopped talking. He continued saying, I knew that he had friends long before you did. He held parties in our house before we ever moved in. Did you know that? I bet you didn't. And aren't you wondering what happened to his missing fingers? Well, it was during one of those parties. People were laughing and drinking, 
Two people were fucking off in the far corner. Nobody seemed to care. There was a shot of a man clawing at his face. I don't know why. Well, Butcher Face eventually walked over to his table, put the camera down on it, and then he put his hand down, inches from the camera. He pulls out this machete and then stabs it straight down into the table, cutting off his fingers. He didn't make a sound. That had to be fucking painful, and he didn't even make a peep. Just imagine how much self-control you need to do that. Anyway, after cutting off his fingers, he picks them up and he eats them. Just stuffs them down his throat. Well, I had to know how anyone could be able to do that. The thing is, I didn't have many ways to get my hands on any new butcher face media. Especially since you guys had kept me out of the fucking loop. We tried to tell him that we kept him out of it just for this reason. We didn't want him to be pulled in. But he cut us off saying, No, you wanted his messages for yourselves. If you didn't, you would have ignored him a long time ago. But you guys helped anyway. I couldn't find much more of his media until I found that box under Dash's table. I can't believe you threw that away. Don't worry. I got it out of there before the trash guy could get it. Surprised, I said, you took it? And then I realized why Butcher Face had started this countdown. He thinks that I still have the box. He wants me to open it before the countdown ends. I said, Evan, he thinks I still have the box, and if he doesn't have any evidence that I know what's in it, he's going to do something. He claimed that I didn't deserve to know what was in the box, but what he found had led him onto the path that he's on now. We all started pleading for him to come home. He got angry and yelled at us to shut up. When he stopped talking, he immediately calmed down and said, Don't worry, I'll visit you soon. He has many friends. You wouldn't even believe it. And Dash? He left a message for you in my basement. And hung up. We all looked at each other and turned toward the basement door. Chris's mother told us to just leave. But Regina disagreed, saying that if there's something dangerous coming, it'd be good to know what it is. Emma agreed with her and said that if it was a warning, we should know what it is. They both grabbed my arms and proceeded toward the door. Regina opened the door and we slowly climbed down the stairs. The basement was pitch black. All we had was my flashlight to lead us down. What we found down there was a cement floor, the middle of which had been chipped away and a pit dug into the dirt below it. Regina stayed standing on the stairs while Emma and I walked deeper into the room, keeping our backs against the wall. We kept a distance between us and the pit and squeezed past it. A small door sat on the opposite wall. I shone my light through it and found something smeared on the bricks with clumpy dirt. It was a message that said, this count is almost done, and you will realize it will be you who has won. Emma looked at it, confused, and asked, What the hell does that mean? We then all of a sudden heard a rustling sound coming from the shadows of the dirt pit. Regina, still on the stairs, stared at the pit, saying, Something's down here! Let's go! Move! The loose dirt around the edge of the hole began to fall into the darkness as if something was clawing its way out. I avoided the hole with the flashlight, not wanting to know what was in there, and we ran past it and up the stairs. After that, we all left, and that leads us to today. If you remember, the calendar page that I received in Dr. Feedham's office pointed to this day, January 17th, 2013. It's 2 a.m. here. I guess I'm writing this because I'm nervous. I don't know what's coming, and while I was typing this last paragraph, I got a text from someone named Felix, a contact that I hadn't added to my phone. It only said zero. Evan said that Butcherface has many friends. I don't know what to expect. He wanted me to open the box before now. That has been made impossible because of Evan. 
Okay, I'm sorry to change the subject. There was a knock at my door. I was freaked out, and I was almost ready to call the cops, but it's all right. It was just my parents. They say they want to talk. Uh, I told them I'll come back in a second. I just wanted to finish this up. Uh, okay, they keep knocking. I have to go. Hey, kids. Now, I understand there are other entries in the Butcher Face series, but I think this one has enough WTF in it to just call it good. Some folks, it seems, just don't learn. So stay scary, wildlings. When you're dealing with a mimic, make sure you can tell the difference. And make the most of your nights.